Okay, so this is part of our World Leaders in Cryptography uh, series. And we're very lucky to have Vincent Raymond, one of the co-creators of the NIST-defined AES Advanced Encryption Standard, also known as Raindal. He also defined, designed, co-designed the Whirlpool hashing method, along with designing other block ciphers such as Square and Shark. In 2002, Vincent was included in the top 100 innovators in the world under the age of 35, and along with John Damon, was awarded the RSA uh, Award for Excellence in Mathematics. His paper on the design of Raindal has been cited over 8,900 times and received over uh, 26, and he's received over 26,000 citations for his research work. So my first question to you, Vincent, is what's your current role and what does a typical day involve for you? Okay, thank you, Pat, for your nice words. Um, so I'm currently a full-time professor at the University of Leuven in Leuven, Belgium. Uh, we have only one university in Leuven, but it has uh, many faculties. Um, and so in the first semester, I'm actually teaching almost full-time because uh, except for one lect uh, one course, all my courses are in the first semester. Um, in the remaining time, I am also program director of a master's program, Master in Electrical Engineering. And then I have a couple of PhD students that I supervise, and together we do some research. But that's, yeah, less than one-fourth of my time, sadly. Yeah, that's great. And why is it that Belgium as a country produces so many great cryptographers? I mean, it's not a large country like Germany or France or the US. What what makes it special that Belgium produces all these amazing people? Yeah, so um, Belgium needs to rely on its brains. Huh? So we prize education because um, yeah, we don't have anything else. Huh? We don't have any natural resources. Um, we are not strategically placed. Um, so um, we try to sell our brains. So that means that all kids here get a lot of uh, mathematics during uh, primary school, secondary school. And I think that's a good basis uh, to study cryptography later. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and at school, what sparks your interest in maths and cryptography? Yeah, so what I like about math is that the it's a low, I consider it to be a low entry science because with a few axioms, you can already play around and, and prove theorems. And then as you advance, of course, it becomes more complicated. And But uh, you can start quite easy yeah, and, and solve interesting puzzles and, and get surprising results. And the cryptography part... Yeah, it comes from a kind of, um, I would say, a competitive spirit, uh, because in cryptography, it's also outwitting one another. So someone designs something, and then you can try to break it. And if you can, you yeah, you show that in some aspect you're smarter than the guy who designed it, because he didn't think of something that you did. And that's fun. At least as a boy, that was fun, and then I stayed in it forever. That's good. And so you, I, I, I studied electrical engineering a long time ago, and I still remember complex numbers, genotation, uh, waveforms, and uh, capacitors, inductors, and and things like that. So why did you pick electrical engineering for your undergraduate degree, and why did you study in the university that you that you went to? Um. So in Belgium, the, the Leuven University is, is the largest one. It's the oldest one, the largest one. Um, it's also in the city where I was born, so it was convenient. Um, and so, yeah, there was no reason to consider another university. Um, and electrical engineering, traditionally, um, at our faculty is, I would say, the the department that's most oriented towards advanced research um, includes most mathematics because yeah, 
all these control aspects, also the the modeling of of transistors and semiconductors and all that requires a lot of mathematics. Um, so I chose it for the challenge rather than because I'm an interest in, in, in conductors or things like that. Yeah. That's great. And for your PhD, why did you pick block ciphers as a topic? Did you have really some choices as to the direction of your PhD and you ended up doing block ciphers or was block ciphers something that you were interested in before you started your PhD? Uh, yeah, I also did a master thesis on on the uh, S boxes used in this. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I didn't have much choice in that, let's say, because there's only a few topics proposed and you have to pick one of them. And um, then it was a kind of natural start for the PhD uh, to continue uh, the master thesis work in that. And also, when I did my PhD, there were not that many publicly known algorithms. And so the best known one was the DES, which is a block cipher. Um, and there was a little bit talk about RC4, but that wasn't even public by then. Uh, and so that was the only stream cipher I think that was in the picture. So there was no other real topic than looking at DES and it was a block cipher. Yeah. So the time it was AES was standardized, I think, was it 2001? So what was the timeline before that? There must, like, was quantum cryptography has taken about five years to be standardized. What was the timeline, if you can remember, and it was a while ago, for that run-up? Because there was rounds and then there was the final rounds that we can talk about, but what was that? What was the process that happened around the AES standard? Yeah, so in 97, NIST started to um, to travel at all crypto conferences and announced that they were going to start uh, an, an initiative to find a new standard. So they were basically advertising, they were soliciting um, submissions uh, because um, that many years ago when I standardized this, they also were soliciting submissions, but they didn't get many. So now they wanted more. And then in 98 was the official deadline for submitting. I think early 98, the official call came out and middle of 98 um, was a submission deadline. And then in August, we had uh, the first AS conference where all the candidates were proposed. Uh, one was broken at this conference. Uh, and then the first round started, and that took about a year. Um, and then um, five candidates were left as finalists. There was another round for slightly more than a year. And then um, they made a selection. Um, so that was, you could say, the technical part of the process. And then there was an additional 18 months of drafting the standard, um, collecting the signatures on the standard, putting it out for comments, and then publishing it, and then uh, having it become effective. Yeah, that's great. And what were your main motivations? I know it's difficult to define technical motivations, but what influenced your design? It obviously uses S-boxes and, and the permutation and the the shuffles and it creates this 128 bit block and so on. Oh, oh. How did you architect? What was the what was the motivation behind this this amazing creation? Yeah, so there were several things, of course. Eh? So um one of the main drivers was that when Johan and I, when we did our PhD research, there was a lot of emphasis on the design of S-boxes and people were only looking at S-boxes and not at ciphers or at least in, in the published papers that was the case and then we had a kind of um, counter idea and said like we shouldn't look at the S-box only and uh, you should also look at the other parts of the cipher and then um, Johan basically formulated this idea of the white trail uh, strategy where you try to find linear parts that make sure that 
uh, the S-boxes are well connected and that any change uh, propagates widely, diffuses, we say. Um, and that relates, that leads to criteria on the linear parts. And then he had this idea. And then um, I realized then that the properties that he was looking for in, in the linear layers actually can be translated to properties of linear codes, error correcting codes. And so that's then uh, why we made a design based on fairly theoretic codes. That was the shark design. And that had all the properties that we wanted, except that it was a bit um, slow, particularly on the architecture that were available then. So then we made optimizations uh, towards Square. Um, and then when we had published that cipher, then came the call from NIST. Or then we knew that NIST would launch the call. So then it was natural to yeah, to, to stay working on that, eh? um, take into account the comments that we received and, and fine tune it. Uh, yeah. That's, that's amazing. And did you actually think you would win the competition? I mean, this is a massive competition. Whoever wins it is saving the internet. I mean, securing, we had so many ciphers and they had problems. Uh, and this was the amazing opportunity to really secure the planet really uh, virtually every web connection that we have uses aes now that or cha cha 20 but aes is the standard did you ever think that a couple of cryptographers from belgium would really win this amazing competition yeah so first i should maybe point out that it's of course not only aes that secures the planet there's a it's oh, just yes. one <laughs> thing in a long chain of things that need to be right. Um, and when we started the competition, yeah, we were not very hopeful huh? because we, we made the same reasoning like you, like yeah, two boys from a small country. And yeah, then there is IBM competing and RSA, big companies, big security companies. But then when we started studying the designs, and we quickly got a feeling like that actually we had one of the best designs in the competition. Yeah? Uh, and that, for example, the IBM design was what was yeah, bad, I would say. Yeah, I, I I still don't understand why they didn't work harder on it. Yeah. Um so then we started thinking like this could be possible. Huh? Uh and then so we were, I think. As soon as we had seen your designs, we said we should be among the final five. That that would only be fair. And we were, yeah. And then, of course, yeah, then you find yourself among the very big ones. And then, you know, it's also a bit of luck that you need to have and uh, to have gotten it quite right or to convince the jury that uh, your strong points outweigh your weak points and that it's not the case for the other submissions. Um, yeah, and then it worked out. Well, yeah, after a while, you just start yeah, hoping, uh, thinking positively, not thinking about what would hinder you, but just looking at the good things. And there were a few polls also during the AES conferences organized by NIST. And I think in the first poll, uh, we were almost everyone's second choice. So people had different first choices, but we were always second choice. And then in the last poll, we were the first choice of most people. So we, yeah, we felt like the public is on our side. So uh, why shouldn't we win? As I remember, you had um, a serpent up against that was that was almost second place, and and obviously the the came the work from Cambridge. Uh, was very strong. I think you had RC6, is that is that right? Yeah, there was there? RC6 from the RSA company. There was Mars still from IBM. Mars, yeah. And then there was uh, from Bruce Schneider, uh, Two Fish. Two Fish, after Blue Fish and all yeah. the other ones. Oh, Bruce Schneider, yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what do you think it was about yours that 
that triumphed in the end because it was very close between you and Serpent, and I think maybe they they tweaked the security up because it's that it's that getting the balance right. Uh, if you if you reduce the security too much, then then you open the window to be cracked. But obviously, the more security you have, the the worse the performance. So do you think you just you just tweaked, you just tuned in that last phase? Was that the thing that got you through, or or is there a special property that you can see in ES that or Rindal that allowed you to to win? No, I think you got it quite right that. Um... Serpent was plagued by being too slow. In particular, in software, it was too slow. And um, yeah, I would say that's maybe the difference between an engineer and a scientist, and that the designers of Serpent were three pure scientists. And as an engineer, also trained to look at costs and to say at a certain time, the cost-benefit ratio is no longer... Good, and you have to stop adding more and more rounds, more and more components. Um, so that's, I think, what made the difference in the end. Yeah, that's great. If you look back at the, I mean, we we spoke to Whitfield Duffy, and it was amazing. Nineteen seventy six, he came up with public key encryption, and Marty Hellman did the maths. Doesn't look complex math just now, but that one paper really built the whole world of, of cryptography after that, and then then Rivest and, and Shamir came along. But if you look at the original RSA paper, I think they talked about, so the, the paper that was published in Martin Gardner's Scientific American, they talked that this was going to be secure for billions and billions of years with these sizes of numbers. <laughs> yeah, these that was, yeah. These are little toy numbers that we deal with now. So your method has survived one, two decades and, and more. Did you really think that that it would stay secure? That you haven't really tweaked it. You'll see Blake 1 and Blake 2 and Blake 3 are, are all tweaked and improved and things like that. But your method has stayed the same. Uh, so can you believe that it stayed secure for so long? Yeah, yeah. But I mean... So to be fair, we were very lucky because if, we, if you if you look at it from listen to be at a head start, because we had both just completed our PhDs on block ciphers, and then came the call, huh? and so we had already the shark design, the square design. All the other teams started basically from close to zero. Huh? I mean, there was blowfish, but two fish doesn't really look like blowfish. Huh? And there were the RC5, but RC6 is completely different from RC5. Uh, and so, um, so we had a lot of time. We already fine-tuned before the start of the competition. Huh? So because Rheindal is a fine-tuning of Square, which is a fine-tuning of Shark. So we, ha we had it, but yeah, because... Part of it happened before the AS competition, and part of it you where you you don't see it that clearly anymore. I think. Um, and so it goes it goes back to the original Des the Lucifer cipher, which I think was a sixty four bit block, eight bytes at a time, and I think some people criticised that at the time. I think Bruce Steyer's method for AES was a variable block size, if, if I remember. You can use 512 bits or, or, or more. So you had that flexibility. What, what, was, what was so special about the 128-bit block size? Did, did you think that... that yeah, so NIST, uh, NIST originally asked for variable block size. Uh -huh. Um yeah, so that and some of the designs made it. Some other design teams convinced NIST that it couldn't be done. Huh? But mm -hmm. actually, both the original Rheindal and uh, Two Fish supported this variable uh, block size. Um, mm -hmm. But it was not standardized because, yeah, NIST listened to, to the complainers and said, "Okay, we we um, 
we will not require it and we will also not evaluate the other block sizes. So we will also not standardize the other block sizes then. Um, and so, yeah, 128, I think is, well, 64 is too small huh? because yeah. if with almost all the modes of operation to use a block cipher, you have what we call the, the, the square root bound. Huh? So that if the number of blocks you encrypt is about the square root of the number of possible blocks, then you get uh, weaknesses. Yeah, it's difficult to avoid them, and so you can do the math with the sixty-four bit block. It's it's too, after a couple of gigabytes, you already run into problems, and with the one twenty-eight bit, which is the next power of two, um, you don't have that problem. But that's all the, the reasoning there is behind it. I think. Um, that's good. Yep. And and obviously, John moved on to do the SHA three with the sponge function and now you can look at integrating a symmetric key method with the hashing method and you can reduce your code size and and that was a major discovery is there anything in aes that you left out that you regret that you you should have put in no i would have done a few things differently now because i think that as boxes could have been made in such a way that they could be made smaller in hardware and the key schedule could have been uh, a bit different um maybe that should have been a bit more complicated although 10 years ago i would have said i would have liked to make it more simple so uh, yeah but we keep on getting new insights about how a key schedule should look like we didn't know it back then uh, uh, we did something um, and the SVOX is also because we didn't have time to to really study the hardware implementation. And then because we could have exactly the same mathematical security, but with smaller hardware, if we had chosen another field representation uh, for the box. Yeah. I think there's there's now ciphers that have two S boxes. And I think I've even seen four S boxes. I, I don't quite understand the advantages for that but obviously you hope fingers crossed and the world hopes <laughs> that someone hasn't cracked it i mean obviously side channels side channels kind of gives away that was that wasn't a big problem at the time was it side channels they didn't this didn't analyze side channel analysis as much as they would do these days yeah indeed because it it had been found out only recently and and you could see that i think all of the designers were claiming that their designs were secure against it but if i see what we claimed then it was actually completely our claims were completely wrong based on incomplete understanding of how powerful these attacks are um, but you can implement it securely but not in the way that we made out then and it's more complex than it looked yeah and the the recent paper I thought was one of was one of my favorite papers was too much crypto. I don't know if it was ever published in a in an official journal anywhere. It was very stinging about the way that we actually create these enormous security uh, issues. There, there's a paper by Dijkstra I think that talks about the amount of energy it would take to crack different levels of symmetric key, public key, and hashing methods. And uh, you can boil a teaspoon of water, that's the energy it would take to to crack, I don't know, something like a 50-bit symmetric key. And it goes up to a, a shower um, and a swimming pool for about 80 bits and so on. And then if you go up to something like 128, you'll have to boil all the water on the planet to crack one key with with encryption so this paper really outlines are we ramping up security to ginormous scale that, that really we don't need that and i think what was said is that why don't we reduce the number of rounds and i think with uh kitcha and uh, the sha three they wound back the number of rounds involved so that sha three uh, was 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 much more lightweight, uh, but much much faster. So, how how 
do, do you think you were right in picking 10, 12, and 14? Or, or is there a is there a is there a mathematical linkage that says it should be 10 or where, where did you come up with that number? Could it have been five? Would it still have been secure enough? Well, at the time of design, we knew that if you take six rounds, there is a, a kind of mathematical attack that's yeah. maybe not feasible in practice. But yeah, anyway, we no one would have liked that as a standard with already kind of theoretical attack on it. And that attack got improved to seven rounds. Uh, for some key links, you can even say um, eight rounds. It becomes a very much academic attack so you could argue actually is it relevant in practice huh? but um but okay um so i think 10 is just a bit more than that um maybe now you could say it could have been less but at the time when we were in the competition uh, I'm sure if we had then set eight, we would not have been winners. Yeah, that was uh, because actually people were advocating that the number of rounds should have been increased, huh? uh, but Nist didn't want to do it then. Yeah, luckily. Yeah. yeah, and I think it comes, yeah, from a kind of dynamic because actually the three key lengths that were standardized. So the the idea was one twenty eight is all you would ever need. But in case quantum computers become really practical, then you have the 256-bit. Yeah, because that's then the double, and with the known quantum algorithms, that's what you need. And yeah. But nowadays, people are arguing that you need to double again. And because they say, yeah, in case quantum computers come, you need to double. Huh? And then that becomes a new benchmark. And then five years later, people will have forgotten that they already doubled, and they will double again. And so people... Yeah, try to make more and more, but you fall in the same trap as what the serpent designers did is to just keep on adding stuff without thinking about how much does this cost and how much does it bring. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, in practice, we still, there are many, as I said, there are many other things that need to be in place um, in order to have a real secure system. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The nice thing about block services, of course, is that it's a very controllable piece. You can make it easily very strong. And that's why it's tempting to make it stronger and stronger. But you also need to look at the other uh, kinks in a chain. Yeah. So some would say when you're in the final, no one remembers the those who, who finished second, the, the, the runners up and so on. But the hashing one... Is interesting because obviously Sha three uh, won and won very well because it had the sponge function, which I think was one of the first to be really defined in that way. It was quite a an amazing step forward. But the second place was Blake. I can't even remember if it was if it was in second place. Uh, all of your contenders just evaporated, so there wasn't a serpent to and. And there wasn't an um, RC six just just died off. I think there was a there was a pumpkin attack. And I'm thinking maybe of the of the hashing competition, but Blake has really stepped forward and it is so much faster. And it's almost like they just needed that last little tweak that you did for your AAS. But I think now you see Blake is is almost like being used in so many applications. Blake one, Blake two was was faster than the SHA three, and now Blake three is the fastest cryptographic secure hash uh, around. So it's strange that that even though someone may lose in a competition, then if they stick with it, then there's the opportunities. And I think with post quantum methods, then I think even the isogenies could lick their wounds and come back winning. But we'll come back on to post-quantum cryptography in a little minute. So I do see from your paper publications that you're still working on some of the security. I don't know if we should define them as flaws, but some of the weaknesses of, of AES, 
can you identify what you think if 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 I was an adversary and needed to crack ES and I had an usher of resources, what what's the small little flaws that that could be worked on and how can they be addressed? Yeah, so I think um There are still many people who want to use block ciphers in what we call a hash function mode. Huh? So for some reason, they don't want to use uh, SHA-3 or Blake. They say we want to make something built around AES. Um, or even if you look at the reasonings that prove the security um, of both Blake and, and SHA-3, they kind of assume that you can analyze in the same way as a block cipher, and actually there are differences. Um, and in the case of AES, we already investigated in quite some detail what can happen um, in a hash function, because you briefly said, you know the key actually, right? because in a hash function there are no secrets. And whereas most analysis is based on averaging over the unknown key and then doing that kind of analysis, it really doesn't apply for hash functions. And in AES, we found already what you could call irregularities and that distributions that are not uniform at all, but are peaking in some ways. And for a block cipher, I don't see how anyone could exploit that. But if it's used as a hash function, that could be used to speed up collision search. Um, and so, yeah, that's actually what interests me most is to uh, play pretend that suppose a yes was a hash function, how would we then break it? And then maybe in the next step, we can apply the same tricks um, to attack Chatri. And if we can do that, then maybe later also Blake. Yeah, yeah that's great. And if you, if you look at the timeline, so we start at the late 1970s, mid 1970s of the rise of uh, public key encryption, Stanford and MIT <laughs> coming together and creating amazing, amazing advancements. And it was such a special time. And then you see Shamir working on the, the zero knowledge proof, the Sh Shamir heuristic. And then you've got Kravitz working and Shore, Snor, uh, working on the signature method that was patented at, at the time. And then we kind of moved through this kind of David Cham period, the mm -hmm. 80s and the 90s. I don't know what age you were at to, in 2002, but you're seeing all of these amazing things happening, mainly around the, the public key space. It's almost like the symmetric key was there. That was done at IBM. That was uh, Horst Feistel. Who did that? And IBM kind of lost their way a little bit. The public key kicked in, universities kicked in, uh, the DARPA needed to secure their network. So they, they, they threw money at academia. So you went through that phase and then you came along in 2002. And uh, what age were, sorry, what age were you in 2002? Can you remember that? Because it, you were awarded. It's easy. In 2000, I was 30. Yeah. So. 30. Okay. So <laughs> you were awarded the um, the top 100 innovators of the year under the age of 35. Is Was that a peak <laughs> in your career? Well, when did you finish your PhD? Sorry, between the time that you won that award and one nest, what, what was the time period? So I did my PhD from 93 to 97. I, I finished in 97. So just before the AS competition started. Wow. Um, yeah. So I you said that have, was... You, you must have felt that you were on top of the world to be the top 100 people. I mean, it's surprising that anyone would really know at that time how significant this work. What, what, what is it? You were just a new PhD student, uh, you were probably settling down a little bit. It must have been an amazing time to be standing on the shoulders of all these amazing cryptographers that had built. And then you came along as as a, as a new team <laughs> and a new one. What, what, what was your feelings at the time? Yeah, I think I maybe didn't fully realize it at the time because you, well, of course you... You get a lot of 
congratulations and you travel around the world and you can give speeches everywhere and but then people start to ask your opinion about everything and basically i mean you have a deep knowledge of one thing which is block ciphers because that's what the pdz does you get deep knowledge about one little thing and but people start to ask questions about yeah everything and so you, that also makes you feel humble then because you don't know what to answer to all these things. People get expectations. Um, it's only much later that you realize like, okay, I, I've been shaking hands with all these other big people and people saw me at that level. Um, but I recently read a book and it's about the role of luck and you should not underestimate the role of luck actually we often attribute not enough to luck you can i, mean, I was lucky uh, to be well prepared for this um, there was definitely also a bit of luck in i mean because when you design you have a reasoning but then there is always freedom left and at some point you say okay i think i'm gonna do it like this and then later it turns out to be the right choice, but not always. You knew, didn't know that already in advance often. Huh? Um, and if you had made the wrong choice, then the audience wouldn't have been that far. So, yeah, that also, I think, if thinking about that also keeps your feet on the ground. Huh? So, um, yeah. Yeah, because you, uh, you had the the RSA paper, then the Shamir, uh, and DSC was was advanced and and so on, and then this I can't remember when the SHA two five six standard was that after was that defined before AES? Yeah, I think it was after. After yeah, because then you have now Coblets coming along and nobody, very few people picked up that elliptic curve. Mm -hmm. paper at all and uh, when you when you, if you look at the citations it just just goes nowhere <laughs> and then i don't know when it was if it was satoshi nakamoto adopting uh, ecdsa uh, for his work but just all of a sudden it just just took 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 fire and obviously it's now used um, extensively for key exchange and for signatures rsa is still the top method for creating our, our, our trust. But have you, did, did you see the elliptic curve? Did you do much public key work or have you mainly stuck to uh, crypto analysis and hashing and blocks? Yeah, I haven't done much. I haven't actually done any public key um, work. Um... I, yeah, I stick to the symmetric key stuff. And then I think the, the best way to, to progress is to first the crypto analysis mm -hmm. um, to get a good understanding of what are the important properties um, to aim for in a design. Yeah. yeah. But I think for elliptic curve, one of the reasons that it didn't get traction in the beginning was that um, it was heavily patented and mm -hmm. industry was afraid of yeah, of, of using it. And so if no industry is interested, then uh, academics also spend less time on it because they often have to, to motivate their research by um, showing uh, relevance to the society. But if the society doesn't want to use elliptic curves, then you cannot, as an um, academic, research it. Yeah? So that's... Uh... And then that lasted until... Um, I think it was the NSA who bought the rights for elliptic curves and then subsequently uh, made everything uh, freely available. And then you could see that uh, it was taking on much faster then. Yeah, that's fantastic because because obviously the Klaus Snor patent really held back the internet. And it's only now that it's out of patent as because it was is the Elgamal encryption method similar to this? Uh, 
And I think that held back. But RSA, if you talk to Rivest, Shamir and Edelman, then it made them a lot of money. But they had MIT behind them and they had their company. So perhaps it's the eagerness to to see through the patent is the is the key thing. But obviously it's difficult as academics. You want your work to be used and create impact, but you're holding it back by by patenting it. But I think these days for small companies, spin outs from universities, they really need to be thinking about a patent. What what's your thoughts on patenting? I know it's a difficult topic and you can't really generalize, but for you, if you had a spin out now, would you patent your work before you spun out? Yeah. Um, yeah, as you say, that's difficult to, to talk in general. Um, but my feeling is that currently patents are, are more, a hindering progress, yeah. Or also for a company, I think, because companies, yeah, see it as an act of war, or at least a kind of, yeah, it's like stocking up armaments, yeah, arms against one another, and so everyone is afraid that the other guy will do with his patents, and so technology is adopted. I mean, there is a reluctance to adopt technology if you're not completely sure that no one can hurt you with a patent claim afterwards. Um, yeah. And do you think AES will be around uh, for another 10 years? Uh, Cha-Cha 20 has come along. Some people worry about Nest. <laughs> so they they kind of got caught uh, when they did the elliptic curve uh, back door for the random number generator yeah. thing. And uh, I think it was Microsoft, the Microsoft research team managed to spot this really <laughs> elaborate back door in the random number generator. And I think NIST have struggled ever since then. So uh, Cha Cha 20, even though it's not in this standard, uh, is, is making inroads. Do you think Cha Cha 20 with Google pushing it like anything because um, and the fact that there isn't just the US in the world I think GOST is a symmetric key in Russia and Ukraine at one time and I think SM I can't remember two or four in China I don't know how well adopted it is do you think AES will survive in the next 10 years Okay, um, so you mean not that it's broken, but that people no. might stop using it or just yeah, because or, of or alternatives? It could, get, it could get broken or Chacha 20 yeah. takes over. I think the accelerated hardware makes it. If you do a, a benchmark, although Chacha 20 should be faster, then if you do a benchmark, you'll find that ES is still beating it because of the Intel accelerated processors. Do, do you see something coming along just crazy that just will wipe the floor with AES? So no, I don't think AES will be broken in the next decade. Um, yeah, with processor, it's it's difficult to predict. I know when AES was standardized, uh, Adi Shamir was saying, this will be the last block cipher because it will be included in so many devices and because of interoperability reasons, no one will ever be able to, to introduce something new. Huh? But then it turned out that, yeah, Chacha <laughs> found, I mean, its place. Huh? And there are a few other algorithms that do. Um, yeah, who will win? Of the, yeah, or will AS will drop out? That's... I don't know. I, I guess it, it will depend on other factors. Eh? Like if suddenly um, there comes a new processor company and they are very successful for other reasons with that processor, but they don't include AES accelerators, and that will hurt AES a lot. Yeah, uh, That's clear. Uh, yeah, and it's managed to scale. So you've got uh, AEAD. Now, so you have this additional data where you can now lock your encryption in with a session ID and and so on. 
and you have the GCM mode, which I think is the most popular mode, and that converts it now into Stream Cipher. So rather than having to design a Stream Cipher, you can have it twice. You have CTR and all the other modes, which aren't very secure. I, I advise no one to, to take counter mode, for example, because it doesn't have this uh, Mac uh, with it. So I think AES has grown very well, and obviously it's scaled up. You can't be ECB though, but that's a disaster <laughs> area. That's the fastest, but uh, it's not s secure. So you've investigated crypto analysis, block ciphers, lightweight encryption, and hashing methods. If you were to rank them, which one would be your favorite? If you only had one topic to study, which one of those would be your preferred research area? Um, actually, hash functions, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Hash functions are, are so interesting in the, the analysis. Because if you look at MD5 and MD4, if you flip a few bits, you can create a collision. <laughs> so something didn't go right. Obviously, SHA-1 is on the naughty step. It's It needs to go away. But it's still quite secure. But obviously, SHA-256, it's been really designed well. And you see things like IPFS defining uh, CIDs, content identifiers, as a SHA-256 is identifying every piece of content on, on the planet. It's a shame we created these URLs and URIs because really they're very inefficient compared to, to a hash <laughs> of, of the data. So whatever happened to Whirlpool, that was one of my favorite hashing methods, 512-bit hashing with a spiral structure. And I yeah. think it's used in TrueCrypt and you can still use it. What, what, what happened to it? What was it? How did it, how did it work and why did it not take on? Yeah, it's... Um... So it was submitted to the competition i think it was called the nasty competition organized by some european universities with funding from the european uh, union um but as it then often happens within the eu is that um everyone complains that uh, the americans are playing the leader uh, but if there is one thing worse then having to listen to United States is to have to listen to another European country. So, yeah, that's why it it didn't get uh, a lot of traction. I think so. It's only people who were looking explicitly looking for something different from the mainstream who considered using Whirlpool. Yeah, I mean, perhaps it's too big a hash. I mean, the, you can use shake and so on, but you probably only need 256 bits uh, there. So I think NIST finally, finally defined the uh, the standard for lightweight uh, cryptography. I think another probably four or five years it took them to do that. And they were all kind of based on present and skinny and, and those other ones, but they only take one and you know, it, was, it was a bit surprising, actually. It, it really surprised me because it was never top. When you look at your AES uh, standard, it was winning in in security and performance and software implementations and so on. So you could see that it was always kind of going to win near the end. Uh, but Argon was surprising because it, it wasn't the fastest. It wasn't the least efficient for energy it didn't have the smallest footprint but it, it still still won what do you think are the methods and that's that must just be the first of many uh, coming through uh, and obviously with this you can do hashing and symmetric key at the same time which methods do you think are coming through that show the best promise to come up against argon too oh um, I don't know. That's a difficult one. Um, yeah, but no, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, perhaps we're getting to the point that the sponge function is the 
is the answer and and really we're just iterating around that perhaps we have found the best method to integrate symmetric key and uh and hashing but obviously public key is a is a big problem area for us but we'll come back on, on to that and uh you still work on feisto ciphers and their roots go back to des do you still think there's a place for them these days yeah they definitely still deserve to be researched i think um but there is yeah, there is not only the Faisal, there is also this uh, Lai Massey structure, which is a kind of twist of the Faisal thing. I think, yeah, there are, um, they have some interesting properties. Um, and it's good to have something up your sleeve uh, in case we find out that, uh, yeah, that, that, that existing permutations are, are, have problems. Yeah. Um, but I, for the moment, I, I definitely don't know that they would be better, huh? but it's just, it's something else. And I think as an academic, you also have to look at, yeah, what they call high risk, high gain. Huh? You just look at things that are different from what exists and, and maybe later it will be useful. That's an excellent piece of advice. I can't say to any, highlight to any researcher that you should have a toolbox of methods and not to just take the kind of methods, but to look back in history because something has stopped something going ahead and something along came along, but there's nothing to stop a new problem area being solved by an old method. So mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with that. And I feel, still think the Feistel cipher is still secure and hasn't been cracked. It's used in format preserving encryption. Remember we did that kind of honey encryption for a while where you, you could convert your credit card into another credit card detail with an encryption key. I think that's a, that's a Feistel cipher. And it'd be great for Horst Feistel to be uh, celebrated uh, uh, as much as he should, because he really started a lot of this work mm -hmm. uh, in, in IBM. So we've got a problem. We have our existing public key methods, RSA, survived for four or five decades. Elliptic curve came along. Fantastic. El Gamo is showing promise again in a zero knowledge proof world but bang we hit uh, quantum computers so who knows when they'll be created but they will crack uh, uh, Shor's algorithm defines that we will crack it and Grosvenor's algorithm says that 128 bit ES is going to be cracked so this is a general question but what's your feelings about post quantum cryptography should we go fast should we go slow what's the risks what's what's the strategy that are that the eu that the uk and the us the us are already moving fast on this one they're running fast biden has signed off on post quantum cryptography for critical national infrastructure eu not heard that much they talk about key quantum key distribution that everybody gets mixed up <laughs> you've got to tell people that they are different things uh so what's your feelings on post-quantum cryptography how should we be moving on that well i think one thing we should do is is to leave rsa behind us uh, um because yeah it's it's um how should I say it's getting too wieldy. Um we know well, we knew from the start it wasn't perfect, but now it's getting old and too wieldy, and it's time to move on from that. And so is if you need to call it post quantum in order to to move away from RSA, that's a good thing. I personally don't believe that that quantum computers will quickly be uh, efficient enough to really pose a threat, uh, but there are other technical reasons to move away from RSA. Um, so, but actually elliptic curves or, or something else could also solve that part. Yeah, um, Because many of the post-quantum algorithms um, have not been cryptanalyzed well enough yet to, to be included. Um, and we still don't have good agility in in cryptographic infrastructure, huh? we, it's if we would have a very agile infrastructure, 
then you could say, okay, take one of the post-quantum algorithms and if we need to change it, then we'll change it. But that always turns out to be very costly. Um, so then I wouldn't jump to one of those designs yet. No. And and you see the politics kicking in, the academic politics just now. I think uh, Kyber has been criticized for some and there isn't a scalable... It's not like your method that you could do 128, 129, 256 or anything in, in between. I think Kyber is seen as as struggling to scale. And it looks like some of the implementations have went straight to the top level of security because the other ones just don't look quite right uh, from, from there. So the latest ones are, well, I saw Jenny's were were destroyed that was really unfortunate they looked like to be the up-and-coming method that would be the solution lattice learning with errors been around for a while I said but the mcleese one the error connecting codes and, and you talked about error connecting codes when you started and if you look at the latest round of signatures i think the error connecting codes are the are the most submitted so the and I suppose the, the the worry is that are we going for the older methods because we've seen that they've been secure and the new ones we just don't trust yet. Like a cryptography method, like ASCON has been around for a long time, but some of the newer ones were just new. And even though they weren't hacked, then they weren't selected. So do you think this being around for a long time is... Is, is a feature of, of some of these newer cryptography methods. Yeah, well, it definitely helps if if the problem has been studied before. And actually, it's even better, I think, if non-cryptographers have also looked at it and, um, and also so that we have a kind of feeling that we that we know how this problem behaves so with coding for example i think yeah looking for um low weight code words people have been doing that for uh, for a long time now and so if we make sure that we don't use a special subclass of codes that is suddenly behave differently then you kind of a feeling that there will be no sudden surprises. The problem with isogenies, I think, was that we hadn't considered deeply enough what other things you can do with these mathematical structures. Um, and that's why suddenly, uh, yeah, they got broken. Yeah, uh, because they are talking about symmetric key methods. I think MPC in the head and things like that, are looking at a more symmetric key approach to public key encryption. But I suppose we just have to see. But you, you kind of think that we'll just end up with a Merkel tree. <laughs> and who cares what the size is? We'll go for a Sphinx Plus because we know that it's secure where we don't need a latticed fancy method uh, to do our signatures with the, with the complexity of these crazy arrays. I don't know about you, but I can't teach. I don't know how I'm going to teach Lattice. I can teach discrete logs. I can, I can teach RSA and elliptic curves, and I think I've got a good argument, but I need to start to teach lattices and errors and shortest vectors, and, and, I, and I'm struggling. So it's like you'll have to get rid of all the textbooks, apart from symmetric key and hashing. Yeah. <laughs> And replace them with lattices and isogenies and random walks and things like that. But uh, I'm sure Diffie Hellman will always be around and will always be there to secure us. And I do see that, that there are new post quantum ones that are talking about a Diffie Hellman type because you're talking about key encapsulation now. So I thought key encapsulation was a bad thing. TLS 1.3 got rid of uh, uh, public key, key encapsulation. Uh, key encapsulation because of the forward sequence problem, but hopefully Diffie Hellman will come back. So talking about all the people that have been involved in this field, the Ralph Merkels, remember he was the one that produced public key encryption while he was still an undergraduate. And his professor said that's, 
that's a crazy idea. Why don't you take this idea over here? And uh, you, I think he was supervised by Marty Hellman, uh, the great mentor. Uh, who was your cryptographic hero? hero? Uh, um, I learned a lot from Lars Knudsen. Uh, yeah. so one of the designers of Serpent because he was uh, a postdoc sharing an office with me. Um, and I, I think, yeah, um, from the point of analysis, I definitely yeah learned a lot from him. Also, I could say, but yeah, the, the science in general, that's my, yeah. my mentor. Yeah. Odi Shamir was the one who, who invented crypto analysis he was the great breaker when you when you talk to Rivest Shamir and Edelman it's very much that Rivest was the he came up with the ideas and Shamir was the cracker uh, and then Edelman was the formal theory person so Ron would go to them and they'd go no that doesn't work you can break that and he was quite surprised that he he created the RSA method and he just expected that they would crack it in an instance. And the funny thing is that Len Edelman says that he didn't really want, uh, the paper was meant to be ARS, <laughs> so alphabetical, <laughs> which wouldn't have been a very good acronym anyway. No, no. Uh, and he said, no, you don't, you don't have to put my name on it. And I said, no, we work as a team. We are different and we work together, which I think is great from a research point of view, because I think sometimes in research, we have the same type of people again, and the best teams are, are dynamic and do different things uh, for that. So that was a great team. And obviously Shamir was the one who in the eighties created this crypto analysis of hashes and so on. So what advice would you give to innovators just now? Obviously AI is all over the place just now. Uh, but there are obviously many other areas of advancement. So which areas would you say that they should be targeting at the current time if you wanted to build companies of scale? Um, I think there is still a lot of um, potential in, in the interface between, let's call meat space and virtual space. Huh? Um, because... Yeah, also with, with, with AI, it, it's still, you need to get the data to the system uh, and then the system needs to act. But in particular, how to how to measure things in a cheap way um, and to convert it into a format that digital algorithms can work with it. I think there is still a lot of um, room for improvement there. And if there's one thing you, I know you have a, have had an amazing career, and you're now, you know, love your your teachings. But by the way, what 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 is it? What subjects do you teach just now? Yeah, so I teach uh, algebra one to the the fresh boys coming from secondary school, um, <laughs> and then I have a couple of crypto and security related course, courses in the masters. Yeah, that's great. So if there's one thing you could have changed about your whole career, what would it have been? Um, I think I would have um, sometimes spent um, more time looking at the same problem instead of jumping from one to another uh, in, in, in uh, the run for publications. I, and I know nowadays it's even worse than it was in my time. Of but uh, yeah, if I actually, so I spent a few years in industry where I didn't have time to publish any paper, but I had time to collect ideas. And then when I went to university, I had some very productive years because I, I had some well thought out ideas and I could work with students on them. And so in hindsight, I should have done this more often. <laughs> Um, spending some time without trying to publish something, just thinking, and then, yeah, only later put these things into action. I think that's amazing. I completely agree. We don't have enough time to think, and we're working on too many problems that you never quite know. And and you find the best researchers 
don't tell you what methods they're researching. They'll tell you the problem that they're working on. I'm working on what what do you do? I'm I'm not an elliptic curve specialist or something. They will say, I'm working on this problem and looking for solutions. So I totally agree that we don't spend enough time. But obviously you need to develop your career. You need to get your H index up and and you need publications and and, and so on. But I mean, there are there have been researchers who have published one amazing paper, and that is one paper is worth all the thousands of papers that get published every year. So it's becoming a strange world. And if you were a new researcher, brand new, and just finished your PhD, what problem would you want to address just now? Uh, well, I'm still interested in hash functions um, mm. because I, I I think there there is something um, something missing. Uh, so we we don't have a good way to to reason about the security yet, um, and there is room there. I think to to some fundamental new new way, and then following it up and and probably break on many of the designs that we're using now. That's great. And you obviously teach undergraduate uh, and postgraduate courses. What advice would you give graduates who are near the graduation on the skills and knowledge that they need for industry? Um, well, often it's actually simple concepts that have the most impact on industry um coming fresh from uh, education you uh, you sometimes think that solutions need to be complex um but that's often not the case huh? it's um analyzing what is actually the the bottleneck in an, for a certain uh, if you go to industry it industry itself is often unclear about what really is the cause of the problems they see. So thinking about that, and then usually uh, it turns out that once you have identified that, the solution is is peanuts. Yeah. Um, and I suppose in a world of chat GPT and so on, then we all need to ramp up our education a few more levels and that that lower level of knowledge and skill will probably disappear. And what we need to do is probably become experts in our area, not to think thin, but to go deep at, at times and to pick topics that you don't just understand what the acronyms mean, but. Yes, yeah. And I think we shouldn't be too afraid of of chat GPT and, and all, because this AI is good at, uh, I mean, at writing nice sentences or at making nice pictures, but it's it doesn't invent uh, really new stuff. Huh? It doesn't do new mathematics. Um, and it will not do that anytime soon, I think. Huh? So I mean, there are other categories of people who are, have to be much more afraid, and the marketeers and the yeah, people who... Oh yeah, that, let's say the, the the copywriters and stuff like that, but we 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 are not in that situation. And now I don't hear you. Uh, thank you so much, Vincent. So sorry, I went on pause there. I must have pressed the, the wrong button there. So thank you so much, and it is a real privilege to to talk to somebody who did properly secure the internet. I know that there's all the other things that need to go around that, but the basics of privacy is through symmetric key encryption. There's no real alternative to that, and it was your method that allowed that to happen to stop people from being spied upon maliciously, uh, you did that so I think you should be very proud of your legacy so thank you so much and hopefully if you're over in Scotland then we'll get you uh, 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 
speaking slot in one of our conferences. So thank you so much. Okay. It was a big pleasure for me and thank you for the invitation. And when I come to Scotland, I'll definitely okay. pass by Edinburgh and by you. Yes, definitely. That's good. Thank you all okay. for listening. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.